Hello, welcome to the Bossit Podcast with Mark Edwards and Michael Humblett. This podcast is released every week and is an over-the-shoulder look of a frank and candid discussion between two experienced software executives, providing you with useful tips, techniques, and the latest concepts to help you grow your software business in the fast-paced digital age. So let's get into it. Here is Mark Edwards and Michael Humblett. Good morning, Michael. Good morning, Mark. How are you? Good. We, I understand we've got a. We're both under a bit of time pressure today. Yes. Um, yes. I've got. Yes. I've got calls literally every ninety minutes throughout the day today, and it's a Friday. That must be crazy. And you've got a hard stop. Yeah, so we, yeah, 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 yeah. I got a hard stop. And so, so we need to dive in. Yeah, I'm just telling you why because I think it might be interesting. You you yep. remember I made this really high end movie and they call that hero content. Yep. So I made a movie to true it behind sales, and my aim with that was not that people who actually buy from me see it. Of course, that would be nice, but I know most people think when they make something, they aim straight for the kill. They say this movie or this article needs to be read by the CEO, the executives. Now, most of the time, these guys don't have time to read or have time to watch movies. Hmm. So my aim was different. I, on purpose, wanted a bottom-up approach. So I aimed it at a bit lower and at the mid-segment. And exactly what I predicted happened. So a lot of these, uh, let's say, department directors sent the movie to the CEO and said, we want to see this guy. We want to see him on stage. So now I'm meeting the CEO of a very large bank because of the movie. So you see, Mark, it works. It works. You, but it you, needs time and you need to aim it right. Your perception needs to be different. That's where most companies go wrong. They go for the kill. Don't do that. Well, I, you're spot on. It was, I've had two conversations that are sort of linked to that. And, and it's about getting your messaging right, but also getting your messaging right for the level of person that you want to talk to. Exactly. Exactly. And it's an art. Maybe, maybe we stop there for a second, because in, in one of the trainings, this question com, comes back a lot. I get these people asking me, Michael, you, you, do, you have two scenarios for me. Either you're aiming at the execs, and it's hard to get there. And once you get there, you do a story, and then these guys are not interested. And the other problem, <clears throat> before we go back to number one, the other problem is that you have an exec story that you do at the department level, and that's not going to work. Because these guys, the only, the only thing they think is like, yeah, yeah, you're just going to give me more work. So I think the trick actually is to do it differently. When you go to execs, it needs to be more high level. It needs to be sure. visionary. It needs to have not too much detail. I think the way you, you show visuals, it needs to be, um, I call it a graphical, more graphical, more finer, finer more numbers based approach. And when you go level down, you basically need to really talk about the a bit more detail about operational problems, things you can fix now. And and that's the way I approach it actually. And then I create, I send them and because that's another thing that everybody does wrong. You send them all the material. No, you send them the material that they need to either show their teams or to show their boss so you can get to the next meeting. It's enough. It's just enough information to get to the next step. Voila. Yeah, I've seen, that. Oh, I've, seen, I've seen that. I've seen that so often. I, I, was, I was dealing with a company. This was in the early part of last year. And they were the first part of what they were doing, their marketing actually was very good. They'd really clearly positioned themselves. And there were a few simple messages. And it was easy to understand. You get to the point of engagement, spoke to the first salesperson. And he said, I'll send you some information. Um, I'd asked him a couple of questions, one very specific, which was the main focus for me. But he sent me 11 attachments. <laughs> I never had none of them. I just looked at it and I thought, what's he doing? That's lazy no, selling. Lazy you know what selling. you do? Uh, all of, all, no, I don't think it's lazy selling. It's trying to say too many things. It means you're not certain and you're aiming at everything. You're shooting with hair. But I bet he does it to everybody he speaks to. Yes. He just goes, bang, take this. But it's also his boss that needs to tell him, stop. Yeah, he needs to make true. a tough decision and say, this is what we stand for. This is what we focus. And I see most companies struggling with that. Th that's yeah. where we get to the value pitch. Yeah. I said, guys, you need to be relevant. Don't do this shotgun approach. It's not going to work. Well, I mean, the the in the in the software company, but I'm sure it's the same in other industries, but that's all we're focused on. I yeah. think that the 
two main areas where there is the most confusion because there is the most information is in the area of strategic marketing, marketing and sales. Mm -hmm. Time and time yeah. again, you know, people make mistakes in, in software development. Obviously they, they do at times, um, finances, management, all of these areas have opportunities to make mistakes, but the confusion that I see is because there's just an overload of information because people are always out there hunting for the solution. They want that, that magic solution. There's a lot of people that are peddling, I would say fake information, <laughs> you know, yeah. they're coming up with this crazy idea that they've got and they're pushing it out there as being the truth. And it just creates more, a more blurred vision of what this is, what this is really about. And it, it is very, very confusing. Um, yeah, no, true. you must see that all the time. I'd say one thing that, um, as an interesting study, I, I spoke to two, two different groups of people, uh, last, well, this week. Um, I mean, it, it was about how do people make decisions? Now that, that's, that covers marketing, but also very much sales. Mm -hmm. And there's a very interesting study by a professor, Gerald Zoltman. And mm -hmm. one of my, one of my clients was saying, you know, we, with the people we're speaking to, they're very logical. They just want to know facts because it's a logical process. And I said, it's not, it's initially, it's an emotional connection. And then they back it up with fact. Yeah. And, and they true. were, they were really, they were really pushing it. They didn't believe it. they said, these guys that are buying a software, you know, we're not talking to the senior people. These are techies. I said, they still are human beings. You have a look. So Gerald, Gerald Zultman, he was a professor. Uh, well, he still is at the Harvard business school. There's a very good paper that he's written, which says that 95% of decisions, buying decisions are based upon your subconscious. And that's why I believe everything that has to do with the emotional side, the feeling side, the feel good, mm. let's say between brackets, yes. but that you feel something is for me one of the key elements in your sales strategy now. You can't do it with everything you do clearly because that would be crazy, but you have to play on emotion with an image, with a visual. That's the reason why I did the movie because I really believe if you want to position your brand and you want to position how you move, you need to make sure people feel something, right? I mean, the good or the bad depends what you're selling, yeah, by the way. <laughs> and I, I, I see a tendency. So yesterday I was invited uh, by a um, pretty famous, in Belgium they were a famous um, group who invites thought leaders to come and talk. So I was standing in front of a bunch of people and and what they wanted to know, what they wanted to learn, and for me this was interesting. It's a very, I can't tell you which one, but it's a very classic, let's say pharma environment, you know, and they know, they see that the doctors and everybody that's surrounding them are changing dramatically, very fast, and they can't get access to the people that actually decide. So they're trying to figure out how to do this. And and we're talking about lots and lots of money. And and the, the CEO asked me, said, Michael, I want you to talk about e emotion. I want you to talk about storytelling, so sales storytelling, right. but in a very different way. Don't go purely for the value prop, but go into more of the, you know, the personal brand type. How do you get emotion in there? And he, and he actually started off. He showed some movies. And then I showed my movie. And, and it was very interesting. And you feel that. So it's, for me, we're going back to human. Human self. Absolutely. Human, yes. human belief in humans. And, and, and people do. make faults. And actually, you should talk about them because that gives emotion because everybody recognizes it. Yes, that's right. It's, it's a little bit like, again, you, you've hit upon something that we were, we were working on just before Christmas, which is when you're, you're creating that story. It's a little bit like when you see CVs coming through from people or you see mm -hmm. profiles on LinkedIn and you think, oh, my God, if all of this is true, they must be a billionaire. They must be some genius. Everything that they've done yeah. has always worked out well. Sure. Everything that they've always yeah. been at the very top. And you think they're either absolutely, you know, a superhuman or they're lying. So let, let's, let's jump, not a story. Keep, yeah, keep that thought. Let's jump to gurus. The <laughs> Tony Robinsons of the world, Gary right. Vaynerchuk, all of them, all these gurus, they yeah. always have an origin story. And the origin story it's yes. always the same thing. I used to be successful. Something happened. I went broke and I had to start <laughs> up. If I can do it, you can do it. This type of narrative 
works really well. And you know what's funny? Because I'm, 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 I'm listening and checking very technically sometimes to these stories. And without realizing, I started inventing stories like that about myself, Mark. And that's crazy. So when people ask me, how did you start your company? I, I, I noticed that I start making the story much more emotional, much nicer than the reality because reality was I wanted another job basically and I built a CV online. That's the reality and suddenly this hobby completely went out of hand. That's the real story. So now I tell you the other story I do, Mark, and listen to this. So I was tired of doing uh, doing the typical uh, board meeting stuff. So I sat at home and I thought I'm going to do something back for the world, which I actually really did. And I went to a scale, to a start, to an incubator, and I sat down with a piece of paper that said free sales advice. First day, one guy showed up. Second day, the third day, a whole queue showed up. It's a nice story. What part is not true of this story, or not true? It's a ble- it's a it's a it's a different kind of truth. You guess. What you're saying is that you're. You're, are you creating? When you say inventing, are you creating a story? Because I, I, yes. So I, 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 because you, you, when you look into the I, technique, that makes me feel uncomfortable. That bit because I, I, I no, think no, no, you, I, it's always got to be the truth. Yeah, I yeah, know. So what what people do is they exaggerate certain parts. So for instance, I did go to the. So everything you heard was true. I did go to the incubator and I started walking around helping these people, yes. but I never sat there with a sign that said free sales advice. Oh, Funny, okay. When I tell that right. story that way, it resonates way better. Okay. Because it's like you're fighting for it. It's like, and I don't know why people, I see that all the time when you do these stories, people, they, they want to yeah. feel like, yeah, that's, I mean, it's so weird, huh? Yeah. But well, I think it's human nature, Mark. Okay. I think it's just human nature. Yeah. No, I think, I think, you know, it's, somebody's history is, is quite rich and, and most of the people that I'm dealing with and the organizations, if it's, if it's a relatively new organization, um, then you need to be focusing upon the people and their background. If it's a business that's been around a long time, then you've got more to work with. For me, it's about picking out, it's getting to the truth. It's getting to the core and pulling out the right elements that join together in a story. And what you were saying about what the gurus are doing is they are following the same format as a fairy tale. Now, you will have been told fairy tales when you were very, very small that you remember today. They stick in your head. You may not have heard them for years, yet you will be. You will have meetings this week that you won't remember after the weekend. Yeah, clearly. You'll remember their clearly. face maybe or their name, but what they said to you, you don't remember. And, the, and that, that journey of a fairy tale is exactly as you said is Mm -hmm. here's a nice guy and they went out into the world and then all of a sudden something happened to them and things became very difficult but they battled away and they were heroic and they overcome the bad guys or they overcome the obstacles and there was a happy ending and that's that's that it's like i see it as like a wave where you sort of start off halfway you go up you come down and then you go up higher and then you go off into the sunset and that is that is the very basic storytelling technique. Mm-hmm. And people, yeah. we are, the reason that we remember that is because we had vision and we had ears long before we had words. And words is a way that a lot of people try to communicate when they're in the business environment. It's quite strange, really. And you must have seen this. I mean, I know we've had this conversation before. How many times have you seen salespeople's decks that they've just got words on there. They're just trying oh, to put all the words on there. Because... Or these, um, yeah, how do you call it? These, it's like all these different words, and then it, it starts turning. That's the next level. Of we, it, don't, right? we don't turning. remember in words. No, and you think, what, what, what are you, you – so you're saying we... you don't really know, so you put a bunch of words there. Yeah, it's, it, it just <laughs> means you, you don't know your subject, or it makes it look like you don't know the subject. And the worst thing is you don't get people's attention because they're not really listening to you. They're, re- no. they're reading the words. But if you were to put up a graphic that represents the points that you're telling and you told a story, a story has links – it holds things together, that person could go home and tell their partner and their children that story because it will be retained in their head. It's like jokes. Somebody tells you a joke, and if it's a good joke, then it's got a story, and the story is the thread that holds everything together. 
that's where I think, you know, there is so much, there's too much advice out. I mean, there's too much advice out in the software sector, but business generally, and it just becomes a mess. Isn't it also, I, I, I think also, and that's very hard, it's not only giving the business advice, but also adding a bit, an element of entertainment slash motivation, yes, inspiration, absolutely. whatever you want to call it. And I see really yeah. good speakers. They do two things. They kind of have a really great story and it's funny and you cry and they take you along this journey, which I agree. Yeah, you call yes. it the narrative, which yeah. I, I completely follow. Yeah. And then they do something else also. And that's something when I, when I, when I, I get scale-ups, I have to explain them. Is they, they make very complex things very simple. They, they put like a formula to it. It's like I would explain the sales machine. The sales machine, my friends, has four steps. And, and, I, and, and when I do it really well and I have the one slide with two steps, three steps, four, I, I put a methodology on it that sounds like, okay, you got it, you nailed it, you simplified something. Then I see all the people taking pictures and all of that. Yeah. And that's well, very hard. If you never thought like that, it's very hard to, to think it through and to make something like that. What you're doing is you're giving them a methodology. You're keeping it yeah. simple. And you're totally. giving them, you're also giving them the confidence in you to say, I believe that I'm going to follow it. But the, yeah. the problem is, is the people that, and, and I'm, I'm quite, I've got quite a curious mind. I go out into the industry and I'm always looking for new information, but in the world of the internet, anybody can publish anything. And you're, you're getting people that are trying to promote themselves as gurus or experts and talking total rubbish. It's just yeah. nonsense. It's based upon nothing. It's based upon an idea. They got up in the morning and they thought, that's quite a nice thing to say, but it won't help the business. Or the other issue that they have is that they're trying, uh, you know, a CEO of a software company has to have a business that's operating in all the areas. And they're trying to bolt together these various methodologies and it just doesn't quite fit. It's just really pain. I mean, we're both an advocate of sort of keep it simple, get it done, move forward approach. We may articulate that in different words, but, but you know, you do have to keep it simple because there are many ways that you can solve the problem. But in that analysis, you can end up just confusing yourself and everybody within your organization. And mm. that causes a problem. I, now that one of the other meetings I had uh, this week was an organization that I'm working with and I could see lots and lots of different opinions. I think this, I think that, we like this, but we're not that bit. And it was, it could turn into chaos. And the advice that we were given them was actually really good, solid advice. Is it the only advice that could have been given to them? No, there are other ways of doing it, but it was a strategic linked up methodology that works. If they were gonna pull in all little bits and we end up an average of all of their thoughts, we'd have just had chaos. And there, your job and my job is to go in and actually get them aligned. It's a, imagine, yeah. it, imagine it like you go to the hospital, you've got a problem, you go to see the doctor who is qualified, he is an expert, and then he, give, he examines you, he, he diagnoses, and then he does gives you a prescription or he gives you a series of exercises calling the problem. And then you look at this and you go home and you go, let me have a look on the internet, see what I can find. And there's some chap on there saying, if you've got a lump there, what you should do is go and do some sit-ups. Yeah. And then you go back to the doctor and you say, look, I know you did the examination, but I saw this guy on the internet and he told me to do sit-ups. And he'll go, yeah, that's all right. Yeah, because he doesn't want to upset you. <laughs> do you know what I mean? That's what happens in the industry where you bring in outsourced consultants is they can quite often, I mean, as long as they are experts, because there's a lot of consultants out there that are not experts at all. And mm -hmm. they just, they've been thrown out of a corporate job and they think, what can I do? And they just set themselves up as an expert because you can, there's no barrier to entry. But if you've got somebody who genuinely does know what they're doing and they bring you the advice, the problem is that people don't like to change. They like to do what they've always done because doing something new is a bit uncomfortable. We all experience that. It's like when you start a new uh, physical training program, it's, it's awkward, it's uncomfortable, it's a bit more painful and you have to do it for a while to make it familiar. But if at that stage where your client is feeling uncomfortable, they say, look, I, I, this is not, I don't like this. We thought of doing this and you say, yeah, that's fine as well. 
you're not doing the job. A doctor would never do that. So a consultant shouldn't do it either. But that's a, tough, that's a tough one because they pay you. <laughs> yeah, tough. And you're always worried, but you've got to do it. And that, applies, yeah, no. that, that also applies to the software industry when they're going out into the industry and where they're, they're providing consultancy in that area. You know, if True. you are a genuine expert and you, you, you know that subject, you have to tell them the truth. True. Even if you lose the business, you've always got to be prepared to walk away. True. True. That stuff, huh? Yeah. Most people we pay and we push to say yes. Yeah, and then you want to hang on to it. Yeah. But it's... No, no, no. It's hanging on that, that, that it's the, whole, the, the endless uh, iteration of improving. And sometimes you just get a bit tired of it. And, and actually you realize if you iterate, then it's, you get new energy. But that, that click, and I, I can imagine, you must see this, Mark, when you're when people come to you to sell a company, I think they're on the stage like I've done this so many times, I'm tired of it. Oh yes, absolutely. Yeah. That, yes. That's a tough one, and I see it when I do like like really startup scale ups that kind of business. It gives me a lot of energy because they, these guys, there is no mountain high enough. Huh? They are like, yeah, let's get there. You know, so, I mean, like guys, you know, you don't know how much work. And in, I used to say to them, you need to do that. And now I'm thinking. The only thing they have is this energy. I'm not going to touch it. Right? I'm just going to say, I'm just going to aim the energy. <laughs> yeah, there's, I think there is a change. And actually, you know, when I came out to Belgium, I think you, there's, a, there's a group of people within your, uh, your secret club that I, mm -hmm. would, I see as being as part of the younger generation. And actually, I was quite surprised because you've got a very high percentage of the, the software entrepreneur that realizes I probably only want to be doing this for three, four, maximum five years. The, yeah. There's an older generation that they say, this is going to supply me with a meal ticket for the rest of my life. And I'm going to work really hard. And the problem with that is, and I met some guys again this week, which was they're doing 14 hour days, 15, 16 hour days. And they're saying, yeah, we can do this, but we've been doing this for quite a long time. I'm not so sure that I want to be doing this in another two years. And the problem with that, and I've seen that time and time again, is they get to that stage where they just think, I can't, I haven't got that passion anymore. I haven't got that energy. Maybe they get older. I mean, if you get somebody who gets into their 60s, they're not going to be able to work as hard. And that energy goes. And if their business is dependent on their energy and the hours they're doing, then the business starts to nosedive. And then they say, yeah, I think we should sell it. And it, everything's then moving the wrong way. You know, so I, I keep repeating this and I will forever repeat this is, you know, always have that exit in place and you're passionate now, but you probably got other ideas, other talents and other things you'd want to do. The best thing for you and the company would to me to time it whilst your energy is still high. Pass yeah. it on to somebody else. Take some cash, put a big lump of cash in the in the bank. Your family will be happy. Your next generation will be happy if you could do it right and you'll be more relaxed and you'll be easier the next time round and the third time round. You look at some very, very successful entrepreneurs out there, they're doing it four and five times. They yeah. go through that cycle yeah. because they know what, know what they're doing. I agree. I wanted to um, bring up um, the subject about getting into your client's mind, knowing... You have you have like two three minutes, huh? Because before then, well, I'm gonna have to carry on talking. Compress it. <laughs> I'm gonna carry on talking without you. Or because, I can just because... leave and, be... and and be relieved. <laughs> I don't have to listen to you. <laughs> Wait, we're because we're only at 23 minutes, and I'm gonna get that as 30 minutes. So if you're if you're gonna leave, I'm gonna carry on talking. I'm gonna I'm gonna have it as a test. I mean, I'll be asking you questions. You won't be yeah. answering. And I'll then see you'll where say, it goes. Michael, I, I suppose your silence means you agree. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> I'll say, this is the first time when you've agreed with me so much. I can't believe this. <laughs> no, I can see it's coming up to the half hour. No, seriously, if you need to go, I will continue. Okay. How's, that? How's that? I'll let you continue and I'm going to jump off. Mark. Goodbye. Nice talking to you and I get you next week. Yes. Excellent. Thanks, Michael. Bye. Goodbye. Hi. Well, well, this is a bit of a change. So uh, I've always done podcasts where I've uh, got Michael on the other end or we're doing interviews. But this time, since he is very short of time, um, I thought I would just carry on talking to myself, really. 
and, and hopefully to some of you. And um, one of the things that I wanted to mention was about really getting into your client's mind. And I think a couple of observations that I've made over the years is with software companies, it's very easy for a lot of software companies to be able to sell their product into lots of different sectors, lots of different business areas. Um, it could even be geographic. We could also be taking it from that perspective as well. And I think one of the issues with that is it adds complexity. Because first of all, to be really successful at marketing and sales, you need to understand your customer and you need to be able to get into their head. And there's a really good example. Uh, well, there's a number of um, different examples, but I came, been aware of um, a chap called um, Jack Laguerre, who is the CEO of T-Mobile. Now, I came across his tweets and I was quite surprised by how outspoken he was about the industry. He's not only outspoken, um, I mean, his language is quite colourful at times, but what he's been able to do because of the tweets that he has and because of the popularity, if you go and I'll, I'll dig out um, his, oh, Michael, that was noisy. He must have been tuning off. Um, I'll dig out his uh, Twitter handle, and it, but it's worth looking at because what he's doing is he's created a profile for himself on Twitter and he gets lots of feedback. Now, that feedback enables him to get very close to the customer and he gets to understand them and he reflects their frustrations in his voice, in his tweets. And he, he gets to understand one of the really important things, I think, when you're looking at, at engaging, engaging in the marketing side, but also engaging on the sales side, is what's at the forefront of your target market? Now, if you're going into six, seven, and sometimes eight different business sectors, that becomes very, very hard. And a, and a technique that I think I've seen a, a number of software companies use when things become very complex is actually to, to focus in on a particular sector and go deeper. Um, and actually that's a brave step to make because you may be, a, you may have to be actually getting rid of some potential sales and even some customers. So the point I'm trying to make regarding focus and the benefits that provides is that a lot of the small companies have this natural tendency to want to take opportunities in whatever sector they are. It's very difficult when you're trying to grow an organization to actually sort of turn away from potential revenue opportunities. And I understand that. But the problem that it causes is that you get a, a business that is very much defocused. And also that causes issues in the fact that to be highly competitive, you really need to understand your market and you understand the solutions that they face. And you can't do that if you're if you're fighting the battle on multi fronts. So what I tend to see is that quite often the smaller organizations are those that quite often are the most diversified. What we've seen in the studies that we've done on the most successful companies is the actually the, the reverse of that is true is that these companies that have grown very, very quickly, they really understand the idea of, of niching down, of focusing in on a sector and going much deeper. Because it's not just about, from a technical perspective, that helps you. It, under, it, it helps you in, in understanding the problems at a, at a greater level of, of understanding from the perspective of the client but it also enables you to um, provide a better understanding when it comes to marketing. So the, some of the terminology, uh, the way that you can create, first of all, attention within that marketplace, it can be different in different areas, who to address, what their key drivers are. And if you're operating five, six, and sometimes seven and eight different market sectors, that could become very, very difficult.
the the strategy here is is you identify a marketplace ideally where you've already gained some traction you've got some leverage and you've got some reference sites and and there we what we see is in the early stages the startups is that companies naturally go out and they're doing a little bit of testing and they're seeing where they can gain traction if they haven't already decided on where that niche is but once they've done that and they start to see that there is bigger opportunities in a particular uh, sector is the decision they then have to make is is our niche big enough to cope with our, our growth ambitions and if it is then you need to really focus in on that and really go for it I'm trying to think of some examples off the top of my head maybe I can provide these at, at a later stage but there are lots of examples of some really big successful fast growth companies that are very niche but that's the advantage of today's marketplace in the fact that you can reach out to those companies wherever they are based. And as I'm saying that, not only has Michael just left, but I'm also getting a phone call coming into me, so I'll disconnect that one so I can just continue. So yeah, it, it, it's, it's what I call niching down. It's understanding your market, understanding that you need to move quickly because the market does, and it's really focusing in on that. So hopefully that makes sense. And this was a little bit of an unusual ending to this podcast because Michael had to disappear a little bit earlier, but that's fine too. Um, if you've enjoyed today's episode of podcast, then please like and share. Um, as always, we're very interested to hear your thoughts and feedback. And if there are any topics that you would like us to cover, then please let us know. Um, we're available on iTunes. You can also see the podcast on our website, which is bossequity.com. So love to hear from you and uh, speak to you again soon. Goodbye.